Allah give relief to our brothers and sisters who are suffering everywhere. Ya Rabbil Alameen, salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. One of the brothers, the respected elder brothers asked me, why you start right away your reminder or your lesson, whatever? Why don't you let people pray sunnah? So I told him, we mentioned many times that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best of your salah is the one that you do at home except for the obligatory ones. So this is a sunnah that we, we uh, try whenever we have a chance to remind our brothers and sisters of it. And he urged us in many, many ahadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to keep some of our salah in our houses. He said, don't, he said, make some of your salah in your house and don't make it like a graveyard. Many, many hadith, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also because of that time, so we don't want to also the brothers who are attending the class, we don't want also to make them late. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us always to what is best. We continue with Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu in this series of the Sahaba. And last time, we talked about the care for the physical and the spiritual status of the Sahaba and how Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu uh, gave them a lot of important teachings to take care of their bodies and to be uh, special, to have their special identity and not to blindly follow others, to uh, be uh, special in their, in, even in their clothes, even in their uh, uh, walking, even in their... We mentioned many hadith about that and how also some of the etiquettes uh, about war uh, and uh, the etiquettes of the, of the, uh, in the battlefield, how to behave and how not to kill women and children, etc. and not to mutilate, etc. We covered all those uh, teachings that, of course, he took from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today we'll take some uh, various uh, statements from Sayyidina Umar in different uh, fields of life. Uh, going towards the end of his blessed life, radiallahu anhu, we're trying to uh, take some of his uh, important statements and some of his important fatwas, inshallah, next time. So today we start with uh, his uh, advice for people to use the food or to have the food that is really beneficial. And something really uh, interesting uh, narrated by Imam Ibn al-Mubarak in his book as zuhd he said, لا تنخلوا الدقيق فإنه طعام كله. He's saying, do not sieve the wheat. Like don't sieve the wheat and, and uh, eat the wheat without its, uh, without the, the uh, skin or the, the skin, right? Because it is all beneficial. And now we all know that the bran, right? It's called the bran. The bran of wheat is very, very beneficial and they make a lot of uh, snack from it and even they sell it to put it with the food, etc., etc. It's very, now they realize how important it is. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, 14 centuries ago, he's telling his people don't sieve the wheat. Don't take this part of the wheat and just eat the wheat uh, separate or stripped of or void of of that component of the wheat. Subhanallah. And we all know now that the modern medicine shows the importance of, of bran uh, for the body. And also he, radiallahu anhu, subhanallah, our sheikh, the grand mufti of Syria, may Allah shower him with his mercy. He used to tell us, if you, because most of the, of the, what do they call the bakeries, unfortunately, most of the bakeries, they do not, they do not uh, keep that component of the wheat. Very, very few bakeries in Damascus I know, they sell whole wheat bread, right? We're talking about whole wheat bread. Uh, very few, very few uh, bakeries. So our sheikh would tell us, even if you don't find it in the, if it's not in the bread, just buy some bran and you, you can uh, 
uh, puts on the food a little bit. It will be very good for your for your stomach and it helps you to digest the food uh, much better. And I have tried this. Alhamdulillah, it's very important and very beneficial. And now we know people now everything they try to have whole wheat uh, pasta, whole wheat macaroni, whole wheat, right? Which is very important and all. Alhamdulillah, all yani, people in the nutrition field, they advise, they advise you to have this. Also, on the other hand, he warned people to eat a lot of meat, which is, which is again uh, medically proven to be harmful for the health. So he said, as in the hadith narrated by Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, do not continue or not, do not eat a lot of meat and do not uh, persist on eating meat. Some people, I heard, they cannot eat uh, lunch or dinner except that if it has meat every day, every day. That is harmful for the harmful for the for the body. It's not good for the body, especially if it's the the red meat. They say. So these are, you can see that. Subhanallah, it's not like about fasting and praying. This is our religion. This is our religion. It's about everything that is beneficial for you. It's about everything that helps you live a happy, healthy, good life. Also, we go to another uh, field or another uh, arena in, in, in uh, life about clothes. He used to warn people to imitate the non-believers, to imitate non-Muslims in their clothing, to just look like, or to, to, to love to look like them. This is not permissible in Islam, that you wear something only that you love to be like them. You should not love to be like them, right? And that is, if, if there's nothing haram in it, if there's something haram in it, then it's haram. If they wear like, let's say the men, they wear gold rings. For you, it's haram to wear gold rings because it is haram on men. Or silk clothes, right? This, is, this should be understood by every Muslim man. That it's haram on the Muslim men to wear gold or silk, right? There are exceptions for silk. If someone has a disease, a skin disease, whatever, there are exceptions. Rasulullah gave the exception for those people. But in general, of course, gold and, 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 and silk are forbidden on, on the Muslim men. If you try to imitate them in, in certain clothes they wear. Now, we, some men or women, they wear some jeans that are torn, right, from different places, right? Patched with different patches. So the Muslims who are wearing this, I'm sure they're not imitating Sayyidina Umar who had some patches in his, in his thobe, right? Out of, out of uh, asceticism. But now when a Muslim man or woman, particularly the young ones, they love to follow the fashion of non-Muslims. Whatever they produce, he just like to look like them. That is not permissible in Islam. You have your identity. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always urged us to have our unique identity and to be special, not to be, to follow them. He would always tr try to be different from them. That does not make us, okay, that does not make us like separate from the community we live in or the society we live in. No. If it is something good, we no problem. But if it's something like really like wearing pants that are torn from so many places, right? So these are the things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well as Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, forbade Muslims to, to do, to be just, do things just to look like non-believers. No. So he radiallahu anhu sent and wrote a letter to Sayyidina, uh, to, to one of the uh, companions or the followers, Utbah bin Farqad in Azerbaijan. He was in Azerbaijan. And he told him, beware of uh, luxury and beware of the clothes of, of non-believers and beware of silk clothes because Rasulullah forbade us from that. Also in another uh, hadith narrated by Imam al-Bukhari, he anhu, saw a man, a young man, whose clothes were 
touching the floor behind him. His pants or clothes was too long that it was uh, touching and like wiping the floor behind him. So he said, oh my, oh son, uh, uh, oh nephew or oh son, oh brother, irfa izarak, raise up your dress, raise up your pants, raise up your pants. فَإِنَّهُ أَتْقَى لِرَبِّكْ وَأَبْقَى لِثَوْبِكْ It is more pious. Why? Because in those days, one of the, of the signs of arrogance and pride is that the men, they let their clothes very tall and they pull it behind them. So that was a sign of, of arrogance. And that is, this is why if someone does it for, out of arrogance, it's forbidden. But if someone... His pants are long below the ankle, not for bride, that is not haram, but it's not good. So he said, it's more pious for you, Lord, and it keeps your dress, right? It helps you to maintain your dress. If it's pulling, uh, if it's being pulled behind you and wiping the floor, then it will, it will get torn soon, right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned the same hadith. In, uh, in the narration of the, of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَأَنْقَى And it is also purer. It's a cleaner for you because it will, it will be polluted with dirt. So it will maintain your clothes. It will be pure and it, will ha it is more pious not to let your clothes or pants uh, be uh, much below the ankle or be covering the foot and wiping the floor behind you. Especially when you go in the, in the restroom, we find some young men, they, they don't know because they did not learn. So we have to teach these things, even though they might appear like common sense, but we find many of, of sometimes also men, you find their pants from, from the bottom, they're torn and they're, and they're dirty. And they enter the restroom and they, uh, some, you know, some kids, they, they pollute the floor with, with uh, urine. So then you come with your... Uh, jeans or whatever and you you wipe that urine with the with the bottom of your pants and you're unaware and you come and pray and you think your salah is fine you have to be careful so once you enter the restroom you need to pull up right and roll up your sleeves and roll up your pants so that they will not be uh, they will not get the dirt and they will not be polluted in another uh, hadith about women he said radiallahu anhu that women, uh, don't let your women wear the Coptic clothes. There's a type of, a type of Coptic clothes that used to personify the body. That used to make the body parts very apparent and very clear. As now many of our women do, the Muslim women. They think that hijab is only not to let the skin appear. That's not... The only condition for the hijab, one of the main conditions of the hijab is that this hijab or this piece of clothes, whether the pants or the skirt or the dress, should not be tight, should not show the parts of the body. If it shows the parts of the body, then that's not hijab. It's not fulfilling the conditions of hijab. Still, we find some Muslim women, may Allah guide them. And may Allah help us to, to guide our sisters and our wives to draw their attention to this, which is extremely important to tell them hijab is not only to cover the hair or to cover the, the hands. And then you come with tight sweater and tight jeans or tight pants. That is not hijab. That is not the right hijab. Also, radiallahu anhu, he... As in the hadith narrated by Imam al-Bukhari, he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa cursed the women who try to imitate men and be like men. And the men who try to be like women, they, remain, they, they just want to be like women, as if they're not happy with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. And also he said, Allah has cursed the man who wears the clothes of women and the women who wear the clothes of, women, of men. Something that is especially for women. He likes to look like them. He, 
he uh, wear things like he put earrings, he put necklace, he put bracelets. I have some of the brothers, they asked me, they did not even know. Our youth, they don't even know that it's not permissible for the Muslim young man or the Muslim man in general, like to wear bracelet. He thinks oh, it's okay. Or to wear earrings. It's common sense that <laughs> a man should not, but in this society which is, de which is deteriorating, which is deteriorating, in which the, the, the common sense is becoming strange. We have to teach our kids. A Muslim man, it, I cannot imagine that a Muslim man is wearing like uh, earrings, a necklace, a bracelet. SubhanAllah, this is for women, ya akhi. This is for girls. This is for girls. A Muslim man or a Muslim youth is allowed to wear silver ring. That is allowed. You can wear silver ring if you like to wear something. Get a silver ring, okay? But a Muslim man wears an earring. Inna lila wa inna ilayhi raja. Wallahi, it's a it's a big a big problem. There's something wrong here, here in in the thinking. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam cursed those ones who are trying to to be like men. Those women who are trying to be like men, and those women who wear just things that are special for the other gender. So that is not permissible. And Sayyidina and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as in the hadith narrated by Imam Bukhari, he uh, expelled some, uh, expelled a person who, who was doing this action. And Sayyidina Umar did the same thing. That is one of the policies he used. The point is, if someone is causing uh, moral problem to the society we have to find a solution for them and not just uh, let them do whatever they like no in the Islamic in the Muslim community in the Muslim society the, the uh, one who is in charge is responsible to protect the moral values of the community the spiritual status of the community so there are regulations that just like in any state or, or in any country they have regulations to, to protect the society and to protect the values of the society. In another, uh, in another point, he radiallahu anhu as in the authentic hadith, one of his friends, he said that Sayyiduna, that Umar radiallahu anhu used to uh, criticize staying up after Isha. يَعِيبُ or يَتَجَدَّبُ لَنَا السَّمَرَ بَعْدَ الْعَتْمَةِ that to stay up after Isha, he would come and uh, he will criticize people and he will have his dirra, he had like a small stick, he will push people like, get up, get, go, go sleep, what are you doing now? Go to your house. This is what he's going to do. He, Subhanallah. So I'm not going to do this to anyone, don't be afraid. So he will, he's, he's the governor, radiallahu anhu. So he's urging them, go home, go home, get up. What are you doing until now? And where did he take this from? Of course, he took it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who used to dislike staying up after Isha. Uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Al-Adab uh, al-Mufrad uh, by Imam al-Bukhari radiallahu anhu, Imam al-Bukhari has many books, of course, not only Sahih. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he would pass by some of the uh, people at noon time, and he would tell them, get up and go have some rest, go have some sleep. So there is time for sleep, there is time for getting up, there is time for... So this is something, unfortunately, in this day and age, many people cannot do it, which is what something called Al-Qaylula, which is the rest at mid of the day. And this is from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By agreement of the scholars, it's very, it is preferable, it's mustahab. What is it? To sleep a little bit? <laughs> Or just to have rest when afternoon, right afternoon, or a little bit before noon. Afternoon, why? To help you get up for fajr or get up before fajr. To help you get up for fajr or before fajr. And uh, the hadith that is mentioned from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam: "Qilu fa inna shayatin la taqil." Have qailula, have this time of sleep or rest, like one hour, one hour and a half. 
because shayateen does not take qaylula, do not take qaylula. So he's taking take qaylula because shayateen don't take qaylula. So he is urging us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to have this rest at noon in order to, in order to get up for Fajr and uh, get up before Fajr for Qiyam al-Layl. Last point we mentioned from Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, two quick uh, statements about his care and his mercy with the sinners. When we hear about Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu from some people, you think Sayyidina Umar is someone who is like uh, harsh and someone... No, he was only, he was strict to some extent, radiallahu anhu. But at the very same time, we mentioned many times, you would find two black lines on his cheeks out of crying, out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he has a very soft heart, radiallahu anhu. So Sayyidina Anas bin Malik, as in the authentic hadith, he said, Abu Musa sent me to Tustar, one of the countries in, in, uh, close to Iran or uh, in that area. He said, Umar asked me, what happened to those group of people from Bakr bin Wa'il? This uh, group of people from this clan, what happened to them? Because he heard that they apostatized and they left Islam and they followed the pagans. Then Sayyidina Anas, he wanted to change the topic. So he said, I tried to change the topic. Then Sayyidina Umar insisted and he asked him, what happened to those people? He said, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen. It seems Sayyidina Umar heard something. So he said, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, they apostatized and they followed the pagans. And I think you should execute them. Sayyidina Umar said, no. By Allah, if I... Uh, bring them back to Islam is dearer to me than all of this world. Ma talat, whatever the, the sun has risen upon means the whole world. It's dearer to me that they come back to Islam. Then he said, what will you do? Sayyidina Anas said, what will you do to them if you can get them, if you, if you catch them? He said, by Allah, I will open for them the door from which they left. Means I'm going to invite them, come back, come back to Islam. If they do, I will accept from them. And if, I, if they don't, I will imprison them. Means I will hold them and try to convince them. And So this is why this is an extremely, extremely, extremely important hadith that shows you in Islam, the one who leaves Islam we, is, not, is not killed just because leaving Islam. Those who were killed because of leaving Islam, they were not killed because of leaving Islam by itself, but because they threatened the Muslim state. And they started waging a war and recruiting people against the Muslim state. But if someone in the Muslim state, he just wants to leave Islam, and he doesn't tell anyone, no one will know. But if he starts propagating, then the Muslim state is, is very careful about its people so they bring this person and they try to convince him and try to argue with him and see what are your problems what are your questions and discuss with him and dialogue with him so that his evil will not spread and will not affect others that is the policy of the of the muslim uh, community so radiallahu anhu that was his his uh, position because they might they might uh, have they they might have been ignorant about Islam they might uh, have been uh, tempted or seduced by those non-Muslims etc etc so there are many reasons so he radiallahu anhu he said it's dearer to me that they return than having the whole world finally he heard about someone as in the hadith narrated by Abi Nuaim radiallahu anhu he heard that someone who used to be a friend of him started drinking alcohol. So they told Sayyidina Umar, Ya, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, this so-and-so, he's, uh, he started doing this, he, you know. Then what did he do, radiallahu anhu? And we heard this, that this story a lot from our Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him. He said, he got, he told him, give me a, a, a pen uh, and a paper Give me to write him a letter. So he wrote, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Hamim. 
تنزيل الكتاب تنزيل الكتاب من الله حاميم the beginning of surah غافر تنزيل من الله غافر الذنب وقابل التوب he started his letter with an amazing ayah حاميم تنزيل الكتاب من الله العزيز العليم them. This is the book that was revealed from Allah, the, more, the Almighty, the All-Knowledgeable, know, the All-Knowing. Then he said, them, The one who forgives sins. التوب, the one who, who accepts repentance. شديد العقاب, also the one who is severe in punishment. شديد العقاب للطول, لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير. I urge you and I remind you to repent to Allah, etc., etc. And when his friend heard and read the letter, he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we heard from our sheikhs. So he said in this narration, if you see your brother fell, then help him and take him and stand by him and support him and pray to Allah that Allah forgives him and that he returns to Allah and do not be the helpers of shaitan against your brother. That's his mercy with the sinners. When you see your Muslim brother fell in something wrong, in a mistake, try to help him, support him, pray for him, and don't start propagating his sin and spreading his sin. And No, don't be the helper of shaitan against your brother. Be the helper of your brother against shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us learn more and more from these great people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who listen to this speech and follow its best. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad, alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam.